and gentlemen, once again inside the MMA Cave here on Cable 14. I'm Reed Duffy, pleased to be joined as always by my co-host, the well-dressed today, Jay Peacock. Jay Class it up for the holiday edition. Yeah, it's really for my grandma. Yeah, Merry Christmas, Grandma. Looking sharp for you. And of course, we've got our great holiday designs as we... Yeah, the festive cage in the background, yeah. you know. Well, we're going, the season. we're going towards the holiday editions for the UFC and Strike Force. Jay, a lot of news coming out their way. Both promotions, of course, Strike Force on its way out. UFC about to absorb a whole lot more talent, so they'll be on their way up again. And also, we've got a very special interview this month. We're going to bring on one of the few guys who could probably walk through Gore Park at 3 o'clock in the morning with $10 bills hanging out of his pockets and come out with 50s. Adam Maverick Asenza, 3-1 and one so far on his career, score fighting series veteran. We're going to have him on a little later in the show. But, Jay, the first thing we want to talk about, of course, is UFC 155. That one's going to be coming up right at the end of the month. I believe it's December the 29th they're going to run that show. That's going to be on pay-per-view of your Kojiko provider. So you have to call in or work your old box to make sure you get a good look at that one. UFC 155 is going to have the rematch for the UFC World's Heavyweight Championship belt. It's going to be Cain Velasquez versus Junior Dos Santos. Jay, this fight the first time around was not all that it was cracked up to be. Dos Santos, UFC on Fox 1, finished it lightning quick. I don't think it's going to be the same this time around. I agree, Reid. You know, you got Junior Dos Santos. He's such a beast. You know, he's got power in both hands. He's really sharp on his feet. He doesn't like... He's really good with the sprawls and the takedowns, and you know you got the wrestling of Cain Velasquez coming in after just destroying Bigfoot. You know that was one of the bloodiest fights in UFC history, if not the bloodiest I've ever seen. Probably should have been stopped a little earlier, but you know these guys are gonna bang. They're gonna bring it to. It's gonna be an amazing fight. If you miss it, I feel sorry for you. And you look at how impressive that really was when Cain Velasquez was able to neutralize everything that Bigfoot Silva was gonna throw at him. Antonio Bigfoot Silva, for those who are unaware is six foot four, has a head that looks like he came off of Easter Island. He's one of the toughest men in the world and a heavyweight that's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Cain Velasquez dominated him standing, dominated him on the ground. There was pretty much nothing that Bigfoot could do against him. Meanwhile, Junior Dos Santos, he's got a great kickboxing corner and he's got some Brazilian jiu-jitsu to back himself up. Let's not forget trains with the great Anderson Silva. So the heavyweight champion versus the challenger, the wrestler versus the kickboxer. Jay, who do you like? Junior Dos Santos all the way, man. The Brazilian camp, they bring it. They always are prepared. They put their game plan in place. They got the will to win. These guys are just amazing, man. In the heavyweight division, you've got Junior Dos Santos, then you've got Anderson Silva, and you've got Jose Aldo. These guys bring it every single time they're in the cage, and it's hard for the UFC to find guys that are going to stop them. But Kane, he's got the best chance. Yeah, Kane does have the best chance, although to me, this fight is who's going to keep the belt warm for Alistair Overeem. And of course, folks, you're going to want to tune in next month as we start getting towards the return of Alistair Overeem. He'll be taking on the aforementioned Bigfoot Silva, but that's down the road. Staying with UFC 155, we just got news this week. Forrest Griffin is out of the co-main event against Phil Mr. Wonderful Davis, claiming that he has a knee injury. Jay, it looks like Forrest Griffin, he's had some legendary wars but he might be at the end of his road. Yeah, in case you lived in a cave over the last, like, six years, you know, Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin made the UFC, as far as I'm concerned, what it is today. That free event from the tough, the finale of the very first tough, made the UFC what it is, brought people to it. And now Forrest, since he's won the championship there, he's, he's just slid down a hill. He's looking bad lately. I don't know if it's a knee injury, but Mr. Wonderful was a bad matchup for him. He's a beast, you know. This guy looks about this big around in the body, <laughs> but then when you get up here, he's this thick. His shoulders are the size of mine in your head, you know. Like, I think he might have just pulled out of this one for his own safety. Yeah, absolutely. And, Jay, what do you think comes next for Mr. Wonderful? Only one loss on his career. I mean, this is a guy who has beaten Alexander Gustafson, who's in the running for a UFC light heavyweight title shot. Where Phil Davis almost seems like he got lost somewhere in the shuffle. Where does he go next? Does a strike force import have him coming up next? Or is there a matchup in the UFC that you want to see him in? You know, it's, it's tough. Phil Davis, he, he's got all the tools necessary to be anybody in his division. And that's why I think it's hard for him to find fights. If there's anybody I believe that might be getting dodged in this division, it's him or the champion. But the champion likes to dodge people. So what do you do? You know, you don't want to stop have Phil Davis stop your career run to getting a title so you stay away from the kid because he really is a maniac, he's a monster. Take a look of a picture of him on a scale. He looks like a mammoth beast, he looks like a Buick. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, he is 
one of the best young fighters in the world today. So hopefully Phil Davis will get another fight coming up soon, and hopefully it'll be for another step up that ladder. Now, Jay, as we move along the card, a lot of people have been talking about a Jim Miller, Joe Lauzon fight, but that's not the one we're going to highlight because there's a middleweight battle that looks even more interesting than that. Alan the Talent Belcher is back and looks better than ever, and he's going to take on a man who was the former number one contender at 185 pounds, Yushin Thunder Okami. Jay, this is a fight that I am really looking forward to because you take a look at Okami, who's got a great wrestling background. He's trained alongside a lot of those great Japanese wrestlers. And then on the other side, you take a look at Alan the Talent Belcher. This is a guy who's got brilliant stand-up. We've seen him use some great kickboxing skills in his career, but he's also so underrated on the ground. It's not wrestling for Belcher. It is really the jiu-jitsu talents, almost bordering on a catch wrestling style. Where do you give the advantage to in this fight? The career records both. One has seven losses, the other has six. Okami's got more wins, but Belcher's had a long injury run, and he looks like he's finally passed it. You know, Alan Belcher, when he first came up, I was thinking he was going to be the guy that should take on Anderson Silva. Absolutely. He looked like he had all the skills necessary to be the champion. And he's just one of those guys that you just don't know what he's going to bring, which Alan Belcher is going to get into the cage that night. Is it going to be the Alan Belcher that's always prepared, always ready, and always bringing a stand-up war? Or is it going to be the Alan Belcher that gets taken down and makes look like a chump sometimes? And that's the poor thing about Alan Belcher, but I really do think he's world-class, top-notch, top five. I love the kudos to the picture. Looked just like the, the, the late great uh, Evan Tanner there. Looked amazing. He's a guy that could be a champion one day if he just puts the tools that he has to work for him. That's why we had to use that picture. I'm an absolute huge fan of Evan Tanner. May he rest in peace. He was a great fighter in his own right. But Alan Belcher kind of picking up where Evan Tanner left off. Maybe not the wrestler, but definitely has that great warrior spirit that Tanner had. As we look towards the rest of the card, Jay, there's still more interesting matchups to come. Tim Bosch and Konstantinos Filippo. Tim Bosch was right near where you have to be to have a UFC title shot. He's got the wins over the key guys, even knocked off Hector Lombard, which is a pretty big accomplishment. Then you look at Jim Miller and Joe Lauzon, winner of that could be looking at a title fight. Brad Pickett and Eddie Wineland, winner could be looking at an interim title fight. The return of Todd Duffy to the UFC, and Chris Lieben's back off of a suspension. Jake, what do you like on this card? What specifically do you see that you're going to be looking for in particular? I like the whole entire left side of your, of your screen there. I like the Jim Miller, Joe Lozon fight, of course, because these two guys, they've, they've been in the UFC for a while. They're both veterans, and they both bring their game plans into place, so it's going to be a, it's gonna be a chess match for sure. You don't know. I, I couldn't even pick out of all of those fights you see on the screen there. I couldn't pick a winner for any one of them because those are 50-50 split fights all the way down the card. Yeah, it's going to be a brilliant card. That's UFC 155. It comes your way on December the 29th on the pay-per-view option for Kojiko, so make sure you get in touch with them. And that's also, Jay, for Kojiko, Source, and Shaw, so you can get in touch with any of your cable providers that you can watch Cable 14 on, and they'll let you in on getting UFC 155. Jay, you said it's not one you want to miss. No, it's not one you want to miss at all, man. This, this is going to be a great card, front, top to bottom, front to back. Yeah, you can watch the prelims, you can watch the pay-per-view card, everything stacks up beautifully. But when we come back, we're going to be talking about another stack card. It's the last one in the history of Strike Force. They've had removals, they've had injuries, but the card itself looks fantastic in the end. So we're going to break, but when we come back, we'll be talking about Strike Force, the card they call champions and of course if you want to catch up with us you can get us at www.facebook.com slash the MMA cave or on Twitter at the MMA cave stay with us folks we'll be right back after this break Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, inside the MMA cave. Once again, it's Reed Duffy along with Jay Peacock with you. And now we're going to take a look at what uh, Jay is kind of an emotional card for the MMA world because Strike Force at one time was a power organization. When they started that run towards the heavyweight Grand Prix in 2011, it looked like this was going to be the legitimate competitor to the UFC. This was going to be the follow to Pride. Well, on January 12th, Strike Force comes to an end. It's a shame, you know, just like you said, when, it, when that heavyweight tournament was first announced, everybody in the MMA world was all excited. They were so excited to see this. You know, you had Alistair Overeem, you've got Fedor, you've got Bigfoot, you had all these, these champions from other places in place to fight each other, and it was all set up, I think, for 
a Fedor Alistair Overeem finale. Absolutely. I think the way the start the card was set up on left and right, it was set up that way. It didn't turn out that way. In steps a guy named Daniel Cormier to replace Alistair Overeem after Fedor takes a beating by Bigfoot. What happens? This kid that nobody heard of, Daniel Cormier, ends up winning the Grand Prix. What do you do? You know, like that's what happens. The marketing and everything for Strikeforce kind of went downhill from there. Yep. Fighters left, fighters have become injured, but we wind up with January 12th where it's going to be one more time Strike Force is going to put on a show and what a show it's going to be. There have been injuries and there have been withdrawals, but they've still put together top to bottom a great fight card and it's going to start off in the welterweight division. The main event is going to be the Strike Force welterweight championship on its way out. Two guys, Jay, that I'm sure are headed well, in one case, back to the UFC, but they'll both be absorbed in. It's going to be Nate the Great Markwart defending his title against the man that Dan Henderson calls the sponge, Tarek mm -hmm. Safadine. You've got great Pancrase-style fighter in Markwart, who was the three-time king of Pancrase. He's taking on the amazing kickboxing skill of Tarek Safadine. I mean, what do you have to pick from in this fight? It's experience versus youth, but Safadine, mm -hmm. my goodness, he has been on a roll. You know, you say experience versus youth experienced. Nate Marquardt is so experienced when he was going to fight Paul Harris, he knew he was going to get put in an ankle lock and he put Vaseline in his ankle. Everybody knew it was happening and, and that's what I think won him the fight. He's like the cheater's cheater. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? It, it's only cheating if you get caught, right? Well, then he did get caught for being a cheater and taking illegal substances and gets booted from the UFC and now he's in the strike force. He's a champion again. At least he's got to say he's a champion again. But Tarek he, he's going he's gonna to come in there and he's going to upset Nate Marquardt. This guy is on a roll. Like you said, I think it's six or seven straight Americans he's dumped out. He's the American killer, man. He's, he's a beast. He's going to come out and he's going to kick some sense in Nate Marquardt. Maybe he won't be such a cheater anymore. I agree with you. I think Tarek Safadin takes this fight. He will be the final Strike Force welterweight champion. Jay, you alluded earlier to the Grand Prix champion was Daniel Cormier, and I don't think we're going to be taking too long to break this fight down. The undefeated Daniel Cormier against the man you called the Ghost. He's yes. been around on the European circuit for a while. Dion starring. Jay, I don't think this one's going to last very long. I think Daniel Cormier is going to come in as the wrecking machine. He's on his way to the UFC. He's on his way to bigger and better things, and it looks like staring is just, well, in his way. Yeah, Staring's just put in there as a punching bag, you know, it's, it's, he's just going to take a beating. Never heard of this guy too much, like I said, he's like the ghost. You look him up on Wikipedia even, they don't even know who he is, he's a ghost. Daniel Cormier is not a ghost, like I said, he came into the Strike Force Heavyweight Championship as an underdog, as a fill-in, takes everybody out 10-0. I can't wait to see this guy in the UFC to see what his talent really is, because you can never judge somebody until they step into that eight-sided cage. But Daniel Cormier looks like a real deal and uh, it's gonna be over quick. Absolutely, and fight of the night. This one could be over quick, or it could be a three round war. No question, Jay, you and I both believe this is gonna be fight of the night. It's Ronaldo Jacare Souza, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu wizard, who's all of a sudden got a stand up game that came out of nowhere. He'll be taking on, well, you wanna talk about stand up, world level kickboxer Lorenz Larkin, the monsoon himself, who's 13 and 0 undefeated against Jacare, 16 and three. Where do you like this fight? You know, this is a 50-50 toss-up. If I have to make a choice, I got to go Souza just because of the experience. Larkin, everybody's undefeated until they get a loss, you know, and your train runs out eventually. You hit the wall. I think Souza's going to take it. I hate to even call this fight, but it, like you said, it's going to go the distance, I think. These guys aren't going to want to get beat. They're going to want to compete, and uh, it's going to take fight of the night, the very last fight of the night in Strike Force history. Two guys that will no doubt be absorbed into the UFC when all is said and done. Lorenz Larkin and Jacare Souza, they both deserve it. They will both be going, and Dana White's got to be drooling to add these two guys to the 185-pound division. Jay, as we roll on, we're going to take a look at the rest of this Strike Force card and what a card it is. I mean, you've got to highlight the top fight especially. Gegard Mousasi, Mike Kyle, over 50 wins. Mm -hmm. 50 career victories between these two light heavyweights. Not only is this a fight to see who eventually will challenge one of uh, the UFC's top light heavyweights, this is a fight to see who indeed is the best light heavyweight that Strike Force essentially home grew. Gegard Mousasi and Mike Kyle were almost unheard of until they came into Strike Force, and now it's a chance to see which one goes out at the top of the ladder. Who is the best? They've tried to make this fight three times before. One's always ended up injured. It's hard to go against Gegard Mousasi. He's only got three losses to 32 wins. You're right, absolutely. They're both homegrown in the Strike Force organization. They're both breadwinners. 
They're both exciting fighters. It's going to be a tough call. You've got a whole whack of great names on that list. It's going to be a great card to end it up. It's too bad Mr. Melendez can't be on it, but you've got KJ Nunes. You've got Couture. You've got a Gracie. Man, what more can you ask for in the last show you're ever going to see from a great organization? And it's a shame we got to watch them go by. Absolutely. Make sure you catch the prelims on that show as well. Because Jay, on January 12th, you're going to see KJ Noons against Ryan Couture, two young lightweights. KJ Noons, extremely experienced and a great boxer, but I think that could wind up being one of the top fights, and both of those guys are headed towards the UFC, no doubt about it. We're going to throw it to break right now, folks, but when we come back, Adam Maverick Ascends is going to join us right here on set. We're going to talk about the start to his great career, some of his teammates, and where he plans to go to next. I know there's a lot of options for a great young fighter, so stay with us. Adam Asenza with us on the MMA Cave. It's next. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, inside the MMA Cave. And Jay once again has moved over to my right. Jay, and that means, of course, we've got a guest on set. And as we turn, we'll see Adam Maverick Ascenza, the three and one lightweight from the Score Fighting Series. Well, at least so far from the Score Fighting Series. Anyway, who knows where your career is going to take you, Adam? Still young in it, but you have looked extremely impressive so far in your career, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Now, we want to talk to you first of all about the last score show right here in Hamilton. You took on Tommy Cote, a guy that had a little bit more experience than you did inside the cage. He'd been all over Quebec in different promotions, but it was a matchup that a lot of people liked for you because it was another stand-up guy. And to me, Adam, as we take a look at your record on screen there and who you've defeated recently in your three-fight run, it looked like Tommy Cote came into that fight not wanting to lose as opposed to wanting to win. He almost looked like he was trying to neutralize you as opposed to going out like you do and putting it all on the line. Once again, you come out the victor in what was really dominating fashion for a unanimous decision. Yeah, Tommy Cote, he was a tough kid. I mean, I hit him with some big shots. I got him in some particular positions. And uh, I mean, I remember dropping elbows and punches on him. I haven't seen the fight yet myself, but I remember dropping elbows and punches on him a lot and you know he, he just take it and kept coming kept throwing up submissions kept trying to get up he was, he was a tough kid well when when you say a tough kid you've always you've always fought tough kids you had to fight Jason Meisel almost back to back from Amy to pro then you had Taylor Solomon then you got this kid Tommy Cote it seems like you're always fighting guys that can always go the distance because they've got chins of steel and just a, 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 that heart to stay in the fight how, how is it to transition knowing that you're going to be in a war over three rounds? Do you, do you feel like that? I mean, you feel like that that's going on over the first two rounds? Yeah, like, I, people ask me this all the time, and I prefer a war. I like it when a fight gets bloody and fun. I like getting crazy. I like throwing big punches, crazy kicks. Um, I just, it's a spectator sport, so like, I, I like to just come in there and no give it my all. As we get a good look at so some of your handiwork on the screen, Adam, this was from back at your fight with Taylor Solomon. and. Taylor threw some big shots at you, some knees that landed, some right hands that landed, but almost like a zombie. You just kept coming forward, coming after him, throwing a lot of power of your own, and it just seemed like the difference was that your shots every time, on point, on point, on point, and that's been the way that your career has gone so far. It seems that even when you're in these wars, somehow you're able to find that control to your shots. You don't just go in swinging. You've got everything pointed perfectly. Your accuracy is right on all the time. Where does that come from? I, that's, that's a great compliment. I wouldn't say it's on all the time, but I mean, like just with the guys that I work with at my club, um, like my, co my coaches, we, we, we spend a lot of time on just accurate striking and just flow patterns and stuff like that. So I guess it just comes from that, from just hard training with all the guys. And I got a bunch of killers at my gym. So when, when I get into the fight, it's, it's almost easy to land those punches and stuff. Well, when, when you come into the score fighting series, you're, you're really lucky. You always get to fight at home. How does that make you feel? That's got to be amazing. Get you, get you always pumped because when you walk out there, you turn to the crowd. I always see like, like seven, eight rows in a row of people just screaming from Burlington because that's where you're from. How does it feel to, to always have that hometown crowd? Yeah, like I'm super lucky. Like, like fighting for, for like my uh, hometown fans and everybody that comes to support me, it's like inspiring. So when I'm fighting at home, and I walk out and I turn around and I wave to like all my friends, family, and any, anyone else who is uh, supporting me. It pumps me up that much more to get in the cage and like be exciting and get the job done and just have fun. So I love it. 
Adam, your game is ever evolving. And we talked just before the score fighting. I believe it was on the Wednesday before the score fighting series. You were getting ready for that fight. And one of the things you told me that I found very interesting was that your camp, the Bama camp, Burlington Academy of Martial Arts, they have guys that are going to come into the pro ranks and into the score fighting series. And we saw one in Paul Gilbert that fought that you said could even be better than you. I mean, can you talk about your training partners and your camp itself and what it is about that camp that all of a sudden seems to be making a big impact on the scene in Ontario? Yeah, like starting off, I got to talk about the coaches. Like Clint Alert and Mike Hong, those guys, um, they're super, super, I, I don't even know how to explain it. Like they just know MMA. They know how to put everything together. They're both Brazilian black belt, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts under uh, Marcus Suarez. Uh, Mike Hong has been a pro for many, many years, and he's been around, and he just knows how to put everything together. Like, everybody trains all the different disciplines and then tries to put them all together, where typically at our club, we train MMA, and then all the different disciplines are just all into one. So some of the training partners that I have, they just they flow like guys I've never seen before. They move, um, just stuff they put together, and, and like obviously they have strengths in specific areas like the ground or standing, but everybody pretty much at the club, all the fighters, they, they're pretty crazy, man. It's, you gotta, you're going to see them when they come out, I guess, right? But it's awesome. I have a, a bunch of uh, great training partners. And in my opinion, they're, they're light years ahead of me. Like, I learn more off them, I think, than they learn off me. So it, it's, it's going to be good to have them uh, having their first pro fights and just getting into the pro rankings and uh, mixing it up. I believe, Jay, that's what you call a tremendous compliment to yes. training partners. 100%. Well, they say you're only as good as the people you train with. And if exactly. you, they're as good as you say... Watch out for you if you think if they think Adam ascends. If you think that you're under them, watch out for you because if you're going to be the weakest of the bunch, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's really really frightening. If Adam ascends is saying there's guys light years ahead of you because from what we've seen so far, you have been absolutely dominant in your fights with the score of fighting. So what was your favorite one so far? I mean, the Jason Meisel one was a standing ovation following the fight. That was potentially one of the best fights the score fighting series has. Well, we know it was one of the best fights the score fighting series has had and perhaps ever will have. Then there was the John Roche fight where, I mean, from the bell at the beginning of the first round to when you finished him at 417 of the first round, I mean, the guy never had a chance. Then the Taylor Solomon fight again was one that ended up in a standing ovation. And your last fight against Tommy Cote where you showed how multidimensional your game really is. Which one so far has been your favorite fight? In my opinion, I'd say like the first one. The Mazo fight was probably my favorite fight. Um, it was, they did like a little segment on me and him like leading up to the fight. Um, at, at the time we didn't, we had like some bad blood I guess like with what happened in like the amateurs or whatever. So when we actually got in the cage, like there, it seems like there was like that mutual respect where like I know he's a killer, I know he's a tough guy. He knows that like I'll bring it. So while we were fighting, we just like we had nothing but smiles on. Like we were throwing bombs, trying to take each other's heads off. I was trying to take him down. He was trying to land more punches on me, and we were just looking at each other, smiling the whole time, just almost like admiring each other's work. It was it was kind of a fun fight, and uh, it was a, it was a war, and that's probably my favorite fight I'd have to say for sure. Now you always are going. You're, you're talking about going the distance. I know every fighter tries to finish fights, but as you go through the transition of the rounds and you realize it's getting into the third round, and you're getting deeper and the attrition starts to kick in and the way you've been training and the way you've cut your weight and all those different things, who helps you when you're planning and cutting weight and making sure that you're going to have your peak performance from the start of the bell in round one to the end of the bell in round three in case it gets that far? Um, I got a bunch of guys. Like, Of course, my coaches, Clint and Mike, like while I'm training, they make sure that they're giving me the proper training and proper training partners and doing the, the proper timing and I guess shark tanks you could call it that will uh, make me be a monster through all three rounds. But I got a lot of guys. I got um, Steve Bodanis at SST Hamilton and uh, he does my conditioning. He, he's amazing. He's great. Um, I have uh, also uh, Dr. Callum Cohen um, and I got also endorphins, health and wellness, you know, making sure I'm injury free and helping me out. So I got, I got a good team and a great group of guys that are, you know, looking out for me and help me any way they can. So it, it definitely helps for, uh, for training camps and for the fight in, in total. Adam, what, what's going to be coming next for you? Because we know at 3-1 and one, there's going to be a lot of promotions whose eyes have been open to your fighting style and your success so far. We know the score fighting series is going to be back in some shape, form, or fashion. It looks like it's going to be between February and March. At this point, on a three-fight winning streak, you got to think that you are going to be on a main card for them. We've seen you on the web streams, on the prelims so far. You've put on great shows every time you've been on. we got to believe you're either going to be on a main card for them, or is there some interest in maybe going out west to an AFC or going out east to one of the promotions out there and main eventing one? It, what, where is it uh, looking for you right now? Um, you know, I'm comfortable where I am. Uh, with, with this sport, you can't really look too far ahead. I just have fun, train my ass off 
and I just I let it come to me as it, as it does, right? I don't really try to pick who I'm going to fight or or whatnot, and I'm, I'm comfortable fighting for the score and or whatever's going to happen with them. And I like my area. I like fighting at you know either Hamilton or if it goes to Toronto or this Ontario in general. So um, I'm just I'm just having fun with it. That's that's my best answer I could give you. So. And Adam, finally, as we're uh, getting set to wrap this one up, we want to give you a chance to shout out to the people at home. Who uh, or how can people get in touch with you uh, on Facebook, on Twitter? How can people get in touch with Adam Maverick as sends and maybe even come down to the club and do some training with you? Yeah, um, you guys can get me at uh, Twitter, Adam Maverick One, on Facebook, Adam Maverick Asenza, and uh, Bama's in Burlington on Mainway. And you can also check us out at uh, BamaBJJ.com. Adam, thank you so very much for joining us this month here on the MMA Cave. Truly a pleasure to have you, and as we continue to watch your career, I'm sure we're going to have you on, on many more times to come. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. No problem. All right, folks, we're getting set to wrap this month's edition of the MMA Cave up, but don't fear, Jay and I will be back with you once again next month. We want to thank you for tuning into our holiday edition, and of course, Jay, a lot more guests lined up, a lot more people ready to step into the MMA Cave. So we're gone for now but not for long. We'll be back with you in January. Thanks once again for watching.